The scientific revolution starts now. It's funny because the the name Pierre Marie Rabitai, I know it for I don't know some 15 years when I started my very first book. I did research and on the, also on, on other stuff like cosmology, and I I came across these uh, one of the, his publications. But you know, if you have hundreds of papers and hundreds of books, you, you don't really notice. You just take a glimpse on the abstract and say oh that might be interesting so let's mention it let's put it into the into l literature so but i knew the name for a long time so uh but uh the first time i really realized that this is a, an important topic about the sun was his youtube lecture in in 2014 actually i happened to be on a conference in austria and somebody else told me, oh, you must look up this lecture. This is incredible. This is, and uh, and he, uh, Pierre Marie had uh, at that time given three lectures. I think one of them was about the sun and, and uh, another one was about Kirchhoff's law, which is on uh, at, the, at the basis of all his argument. And I watched these lectures and, and I was really impressed. And, 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 uh, and in this moment, I realized that this is something really interesting i have to deal with yeah it was was back then but a long time ago and uh yeah um that's why i also in my introductory chapter in, in chapter one i i described a little bit its uh, feeling because uh of course there are a lot of strange ideas around i, I get uh <laughs> Every week, I get a couple of emails. Here is my theory. I'm a retired engineer. Uh, you know, I calculated this and th this and that constant of nature. So you are kind of tired of listening to to uh, people who are just boasting and and there there are all sorts of of, of quality. But but uh, I realized at that time that this was really different because I mean. Uh, it, it was obvious that he, he was a, a serious scientist, and then it's easy to to find out what he has achieved. I mean, uh, he denies that he he doesn't want to hear that, but I, I still think, okay, this might be happen to become a Nobel Prize in the future, because I mean, <laughs> apart from there are not many many achievements I consider worth a Nobel Prize in modern physics, so uh, they might uh, have to look a little bit more closely. But I mean. Nuclear magnetic resonance was clearly uh, a Nobel Prize, and uh, this is not just what he did. Was not just on top a little bit more, a little bit better, like everyone in normal science does, improving things. But it's really something, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a revolution in this field. What he achieved with nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Can you give people so, a little bit of context for what it is that he achieved? Uh, yeah, yeah. Nuclear magnetic resonance. You you can uh, uh, get pictures of your of your brain of your entire body without uh, using these invasive techniques like uh, uh, like X rays or positron emission tomography. It's it's everything is more dangerous. But but nuclear magnetic resonance is let's say by definition. Uh, doesn't harm your your body because you're just looking at the nuclei of your atoms and everything dangerous and everything harmful what happens in the body is in is in the atomic shell so um that's um that's as technique as such is something really fantastic and and he uh thoroughly understood uh how it works and and was able to overcome a decisive step for um, increasing the power and also increasing the resolution in, in that way. And that was, we are talking about more than 20 years ago when he published his, his papers about this um, very new resolution and, and uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think it can be overstated how much of an improvement it was. Before Pierre's improvement, you, it was these very grainy 
images of the inside. For instance, if you look yes. at the brain scans before and after uh, mm -hmm. Pierre's development, you really can start to see blood vessels and individual microstructures. It's really mm -hmm. incredible. And I think this mm -hmm. can't be underestimated how much this allowed the physicians mm -hmm. to make more accurate diagnostics and yeah. ultimately treat patients. And yeah. the fact that it was I mean, also... He saved a lot of lives. Uh, that's that's... Yeah. yeah, I loved how you you mentioned that in the book that mm -hmm. that one of the uh, maybe you can recount that story, but but you came across the comments by mm -hmm. a woman who, who yeah uh, yeah yeah I noticed that the, what kind of comment is is it off topic? Somebody saying oh thank you you saved my mother for, from cancer uh, and so, and this was on a sun yeah, lecture right? <laughs> let's go uh, let's see what, what ha has happened and then only then I realized that he was in this in this business of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging yeah. Mm -hmm. But you had a question, Anastasia. <laughs> I interrupted you. I think that I was going to ask, well, I, I don't think that it was a question. I think that I was going to say that the, the improvement was uh, a theoretical one because you take some time at the beginning of the book to lay out the scientific basis for the improvement mm -hmm. that he made, which was not a random guess that, hey, this is going to be okay. Because people were worried that if you improved the field strength of the MRIs, what you would mm -hmm. do is you would burn the internal structures of the body when you image Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you, you lay it out as if Pierre understood something about physics that others didn't. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you are, um, this is a very specialized field. Of course, there is a lot of technique in, in nuclear magnetic resonance. So it's also understandable that the experts, the, even the Nobel laureates, they, uh, they deal with the basic physics to a certain extent, to a certain degree. They would certainly not uh, put into question an established law of physics, which is 150 years old, like Kirchhoff's law of uh, thermal radiation. And um, and uh, the starting point was that uh, uh, Pierre said, I realized that MRI was a thermal process. So we got to apply thermodynamics, we got uh, Planck's law of radiation. This is the basis. And in Planck's law of radiation, as historically, it was suspected that it, the the the, uh, the intensity just goes up quadratically, and then uh, there was the data that at, at some time this uh, function goes down again. Then came Planck's discovery that he realized the mathematical um, uh, function of this, and and um, and the the amount of, of radiation also decreases as a, as a certain point, and that. Uh, this is the ultraviolet this, catastrophe, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I explained it a little bit badly, <laughs> but at, at the very end, uh, I mean, who, uh, Pierre Marie was the one uh, looking at the at the fundamental laws of phys physics, which were behind all this. And at a certain point, he realized, oh, I can try. It might even work better better with eight Tesla uh, rather than with four or five Tesla, because. I mean, I think I think these are details I'm not perfectly familiar with, but but I guess the Ford Tesla was not much of an improvement, and people were trying, were, were just giving up, uh, given that the usual the usual range is 1.5 Tesla or now three Tesla, but at four Tesla, people were were kind of uh, stopping the to improve, and so eight Teslas. Pierre's idea of a Tesla was, I mean, just crazy at the time for someone who was thinking in the box. Mm. And uh, yeah, he realized that. And um, yeah. I mean, one, <laughs> one thing that's really beautiful that you do in the book is you, you center Pierre's discovery on what is essentially an antenna model of light, which is, I yeah. think, a, I really like that term. And I've been mm -hmm. searching for it for a long time. And I think that this idea that light requires an antenna and that Pierre essentially realized that that's what was happening inside of the MRI milieu. Mm -hmm. can, you, can, you, can you explain the antenna idea of light to people? 
Yeah, okay. I mean, that's what, what I decided uh, to do then. I, I said it would be an, an accessible approach needed to this uh, very interesting topic. And of course, you can start with the what you believe is the most beautiful evidence and all show all these pictures and videos. But I mean, the basic question, as you say, we, we ought to understand atomic physics and how is light produced? Mm. Light is an electromagnetic wave. And as you say, basically, you need an antenna. And um, atoms are nothing but the usual little antennas that uh, emit light. But uh, let's talk a little bit of, about atomic physics. That's, that's how light is generated. You know, and uh, this was for me when I... I remember that the, uh, the the conference I visited was in April 2014, and then I uh, this was also a holiday in Norway. I discussed that with a with a friend, a physicist, and then I was emailing to another friend who was a professor of astrophysics, who was very against the idea initially, and well, still still he is. And but that was the starting point. We were discussing the atomic physics and, and saying, okay, how that's possible? Because um, I myself have had never reflected on that. I admit it because, I mean, I work as a teacher, you know, as a high school teacher, and for 10 years, or let it be 15 years, I just, yeah, you, you just tell people what you have read, what you have memorized from your... Uh, university study okay the sun is a gaseous plasma it's a gaseous plasma blah 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 and so on we are supported by audience donations if you like what we do and you want to support the podcast come by to patreon.com slash demystify sci where for just a couple dollars a month you can join our weekly patron chat you can get episodes early and you can help us steer the ship including helping us plan our very first event that we hope to coincide with next year's complete solar eclipse if you don't have any spare cash and you cannot join the Patreon, that is totally fine. Leave a comment, come to our Discord, send us an email. We would love to hear from you. And more than anything, tell your friends. At that moment, I said, wow, you didn't, you didn't reflect on that. Okay. So how, how actually the light of the sun is produced? And it, I, I immediately I, I saw also the problem because if you have atoms in a gas, which are basically still atoms, little pieces, but they're all equal, they're, they all emit the same way, but clearly this is not a continuum, okay? So hydrogen, you know, all these lines, uh, 656 nanometers, 487 nanometers, very precise lines. It's a very simple experiment. You set it up in high school, okay? You observe this very distinct um, spectrum. So, uh, I mean, of course now people, the experts are going to argue, no, 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 it's more complicated as this and this. But I think this is, this is um, the, very, the very insight you have, to, uh, you have to arrive at when you deal with the liquid metallic hydrogen model. So, that, so maybe we can just really quickly, if people are just tuning in who have never heard of this before, yeah, maybe yeah. we just point out very quickly that there's essentially two kinds of light. I mean, I'm just going to put them in two bins yeah, right yeah, yeah, now, fine. just so it's simple, mm -hmm. right? If you take, mm -hmm. say, a, a fluorescent light bulb and you, you know, take the back of a CD and just split it, you can just diffract it, you'll get mm -hmm. these nice little lines that appear. Now, if you mm -hmm. go to a light bulb, which is actually a heated filament, and you do the mm -hmm. same thing, you get this beautiful rainbow, right? Yes. And yep, the sun right is quite obviously one of the most perfect examples of this beautiful rainbow that we can imagine. And mm -hmm. of course, there are these little lines laid over top of it, which we attribute to the atmosphere, the corona of the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. fundamentally, the assertion that the sun is a gaseous plasma violates all empirical evidence that we've obtained on Earth in any laboratory ever, and no one has been able to manage this kind of beautiful what we call a black body spectrum, this continual rainbow on Earth in a laboratory with anything like a gas. And so the way I, I want to add... Okay. The, the, the way that I deal with this with my students, because I also lecture in, in astronomy at a university here, and it's very mm -hmm. tricky, but if you think about an atom, it really only has a few ways that it can vibrate. And we know light is essentially a vibratory process. There's only a few degrees of freedom. And so the result of that is that it has very limited frequencies of light that it emits. But in a 
body, like this filament and these uh, solid condensed matter light bulbs, you have mm-hmm. all of these overtones of vibration that are electronically possible all of a sudden. O- honestly, mm-hmm. you have an infinite division. You can, you can vibrate a, a table in an infinite number of ways, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so, yeah. F- as a result of that, there's a mechanism, there's a reason that a condensed matter heated body gives off a continuous spectrum, and there's a reason that a gas gives off line spectra. Yeah, and yeah, when yeah. we look at the sun, it's quite obvious what we're seeing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you explained it perfectly. Yeah, that's uh, nothing to add. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. And I because you began the explanation with a f- with the fluorescent light versus the incandescent light, and you hadn't yet said that the difference lay in gaseous versus condensed matter. But you got there. It's at the it's at the heart of things. Um, I was hoping maybe we could go through some of these yeah. r- really yeah. important just, points. Just that, I mean, that that's the key sentence. He said in his YouTube lecture, and he said, I'm going to argue that the sun is condensed matter. And I said, what? (laughs) It's kind of a cold shiver that took me, but it was also something that like, click, okay, yeah. Did you really reflect on the the fact that a gas uh, gas cannot emit a black body spectrum? Yeah, And, uh, and so, I mean, that that very sentence uh, immediately attracted my interest the way you already explained here and um yeah i realized that all these trials to fix that model and what what came afterwards were just patches were not really good science in the sense yeah well it's kind of it is kind of embarrassing when you realize it for the first time because it's just this thing that's been hanging there in plain sight your whole life and you just kind mm-hmm. of took it you know, and you're like, yeah, okay. But when you really start to, th- yeah, the first time you realize it's really, it's horrible because we bring it up to astrophysicists on this show all the time and mm-hmm. you feel kind of bad about it, right? Because you mm-hmm. you realize that it's a terrible thing to to have that recognition of, especially in a public space. And mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I think that we have to forget, forgive ourselves a little bit when it comes to these <laughs> things. Yeah, I mean, it's really a lecture for everyone personally how much of what you believe is your knowledge how much of it is at the very end parroting <laughs> how much that's a beautiful phrase if you allow me the deviation of the of the sociologist of science harry collins who says uh in one of his books he says even you're an expert even you a very uh distinguished uh scientist in your field keep in mind 95 of percent of the knowledge you believe is still parroting in the sense that you believe from others uh, it's very and and you have to do this because otherwise you you're ending up um verifying trivial things and banalities and, and waste your scientific life uh in another way you know i mean you can't put into question everything that's the problem yeah, and there's no time for that, right? When in the educational process, especially in grad school, you're just working so hard on some project. It's not like you have time to review the fundamental assumptions and it I can happen it, to anybody, right? I think that it's worse than that is that from my experience in grad school, it was that reviewing the fundamental assumptions was something that you actually were actively discouraged from doing because it creates too many complications <laughs> where, you know, I we were I did microbiology and you work inside of a model system. And when you start to question, hey, is the model system really representative of the things that we're trying to say on a larger biological mm-hmm. scale? Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But it's definitely a question that you're discouraged from really pursuing too deeply. And yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to add, too, that this has reached into other fields. Like we were we were interviewing Steve Grossberg, who's an absolutely brilliant, uh, what is he, a cognitive scientist? He's a theoretical cognitive scientist. He works on consciousness. Mm-hmm. And and right at the beginning of the interview, he was like, yeah, it's amazing how we can universalize laws. And he brought up Kirchhoff's law without realizing it and was <laughs> like, yeah, you know how thermal radiation is independent of the nature of the cavity. And I was like, I couldn't go on. Like, I couldn't <laughs> let that slip by. I was just like, hold, hold, hold on. That, there's no evidence that that's actually true. That's just an assumption. And he was just, he was kind of embarrassed, I think. And I felt bad. And like, it was a terrible way to start the interview. But I was like, geez, we're here to talk about, you know, your theory of consciousness. And he's a brilliant man for sure but he kind of walked into a land a landmine with that of consciousness yeah yeah Uh, Yeah. but yeah 
Yeah, maybe we can talk about uh, Kierkegaard's law death, a little bit. The death of a beautiful theory by an ugly fact. Who said that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's sad though because I, we. I want science to be a place where ugly facts make for better theories, where you're not mm-hmm. threatened. Like a theory is not threatened. You're just like, oh, okay, maybe I need to look at this a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. In my own theoretical work over the years, I've. I've really come to embrace the idea that you're only improving your model by integrating this bad data, right? You're you're only making it stronger. Even if you have to add a new set of mechanics into the situation to explain it, you're mm-hmm. you're really moving forward. And I don't know how we've come to the place where something contradicting your theory is a problem. It should be a blessing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's one of the big accomplishments also of uh, Pierre Marie. That um, I mean, he was he is someone who is uh, capable of capable of of thinking outside the box. But I mean, doing all that detailed research of history, because when we're talking, and as Anastasia rightly said before today, you're not supposed to think outside your model. You're not supposed to ask that question, but always there was a time where you could do that back in history mm. and uh so it ha- always it, it often happens that if you go back in history there is there is no clarity about is the sun gaseous or is it a liquid i mean people 100 years ago were, were discussing it in all seriousness mm. uh, this. so this is one of the big accomplishments also that he has done this incredible amount of research um demonstrating that these were reasonable thoughts and 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 the and the physicists the solar physicists back then they just ran into into an in an inevitable dilemma because i mean that that um, liquid metallic hydrogen wasn't just it wasn't invented it wasn't thinkable at the time and uh it was it was discovered in 1935. The alternative I'm, I and, and Pierre are going to propose for the for the sun as a model is liquid metallic hydrogen. But at the time, it was decided whether the sun is a liquid or a gas um, that wasn't known. So they run in this dilemma and decided to take this path and not the other one. And so everything developed on, on, on the basis of the gaseous model and, and somehow they did it. But if you go back to history, you clearly see that, that uh, something went wrong a long time and ago. This and is one of the most... Up is really is really something great, yeah. It's so, this is one of the most frustrating aspects of interacting with people who are new to the idea is that the most common criticism you'll receive is, oh, do you think that you're smarter than 150 years of physicists? And the answer is obviously, no, none of them know about this. None of them have had the time to go back and review the history. By the way, it's worth plugging Pierre's incredible historic synopsis of the composition of the sun. There's a fantastic piece where he's translated, you know, works, uh, primary source references of these authors because like you Mm -hmm. said it was a very heated debate for for a couple hundred years there and Mm -hmm. it's not like they really solved the debate or or, or ended it they just moved on right at some point Mm -hmm. especially when they were trying to figure out how the sun was powered eddington came into fame and people just moved on so no i don't think i'm smarter than 150 years worth of physicists i just think they don't know yeah (laughs) i remember people particle physicists accusing me do you think that you were smarter than 10,000 physicists at cern no 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 that's not the question sorry (laughs) yeah but these people they don't understand understand how how science worked on the long run and it's not a continuous process but i mean sometimes inevitably without bad intentions also without being stupid i mean it's just an unfortunate kind um, coincidence in history but you run into a dead end so (laughs) that's how it how it works otto hahn ran into a dead end he 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 thought that the you couldn't split up the nucleus. He did five years of research with this crazy idea of trans-Iranian, trans-Iranian elements. Fermi got even the Nobel Prize in 1938 for the wrong stuff. But uh, And then they realized that, oh, no, we already split the nucleus. But it took them five years to realize. 
So you inevitably have these uh, dead ends, but the longer you, you have to go back in history, the more difficult it becomes to turn over everything, of course. So let's talk about the story of how this confusion became the status quo a little bit. Uh, Pierre almost always references Kirchhoff's law when you first start talking to him about this stuff. And that's a very, bringing up a scientific law as the basis for some discovery is always troubling for people who are not physicists. Can mm -hmm. we break down Kirchhoff's law and explain how his attempt at universalizing this relationship led to the disaster? And, and maybe yeah. we can work towards an understanding yeah. of how we I got mean, to where very, we're at. It's, it's explained very easily. It says the, um, the radiation uh, is independent of the nature of the wall and just depends on temperature. That's what Kirchhoff's law says, that... Uh, uh, irrespective of the surface, irrespective of whether it is metal, whether it is wood, whether it's plastic, or a, a, a given temperature would always give you the same radiation. Now, theoretically, uh, physicists have made up this idea of a um, of a cavity, and we are talking of black body cavity radiation. That means it would be sufficient that you have just this black box in the very sense of the word okay you have this black box at a given temperature and necessarily this um, Planck spectrum comes out with has, has this bell-shaped uh, distribution over the wavelength or over, over, over frequency so and uh, well this is just not true because I mean you can either disprove that theoretically but I mean it's kind of might be kind of difficult to digest for the average uh, uh, even physicist but i mean just do an experiment you know and that that's uh, that's this very the very nice garage style experiment that uh, pierre also provided and you can look up the textbooks but there is just no, no there is no evidence that uh, kirchhoff's law is valid for if it's a gas and and so this is this is entirely a theoretical idea, something uh, astrophysicists in at the beginning of the previous century fell in love with because they had no other option than to look at the sun as as this cavity and develop this model. But it's just it's not valid. It has no no experimental and and observational basis. One of Pierre's videos that. I think is really illustrative of this is he actually made cavities of different materials and then looked at them with an infrared camera and you can see that the light that's coming out of each cavity is of a different character. Yeah, there's a figure in, yes. in Alexander's yeah. book about this too, yeah. I think. Exactly. And yeah. so yeah. basically, so we start from, we there's some starting assumptions in the theory, which is that you get a bell-shaped spectrum from a black mm -hmm. box and mm -hmm. that bell-shaped spectrum allows you to estimate temperature and the mm -hmm. theory goes that any material that is in thermal equilibrium will give you a bell-shaped curve from which you can accurately tell temperature and what yeah. Pierre has shown is that that's not actually the case because you can heat the same you can heat different materials to the same temperature and they'll mm -hmm. give you different light curves mm -hmm. and then it leads us to okay. Well, so why is that significant? What so, is so that? Just, just let's add here. It's not that Pierre has shown scientifically as the first one because you would be you would become suspicious if if a theoretician proves his own theory by experiment. No, I mean it's known. If if one looks up the the literature, there is no experimental evidence for for Kirchhoff's law of, for gases or for cavities. But he has. Addis additionally, he has, he has just uh, proposed a very cheap and, and cheap and dirty garage-style experiment, and everyone can can verify this. I mean, you can buy the the infrared sensor, and you can really make this uh, by yourself. So it's just something on top. He he provided, uh, yeah. In the very I think it's also worth pointing out a simple example for people who are listening is is the laser, right, or or any mm -hmm. uh, resonant cavity of light. Because mm -hmm. lasers have 
essentially zero absorptivity, which would destroy the fundamental Kirchhoff equation, right? You can't divide yeah. by a zero. Yes. And so yes. that we have lasers that work, we know that Kirchhoff's law doesn't hold in all situations. And mm -hmm. so it is invalid on its face. At least it has a boundary condition, which hasn't been specified. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, we need to, like, like Anastasia pointed out, you can do this yourself with an IR camera. It's not an mm -hmm. unknown quality that the material mm -hmm. matters a lot. And in fact, when they did these original experiments, they used these carbonized boxes. And it turns out that that mm -hmm. was fair yeah. for a very good reason, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Planck also, Planck also postulated that little, little carbon particle inside the cavity because otherwise he couldn't justify all his reasoning. And I think... Uh, the 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 deeper reason why people are not reflecting this validity of Kirchhoff's law is because the paramount success of Planck's law of radiation, which is allegedly based on it. I mean, um, I mean Planck's Planck's uh, law of radiation, the, this precise calculation of the bell-shaped. Uh, curve by means of the exponential function uh, i mean this you know this drove the quantum revolution at the at the uh, very beginning because uh, in his formula the, the famous constant h planck's quantum of action appeared so and so we so get the, the photon basically the history of modern physics appears to be based on planck's law which is of course valid no doubt on that but i mean by, he justified his reasoning by uh, making reference to Kirchhoff's law because it was easy to use, and, and so, and I mean, Planck's law is is valid, and as I say, the, the major importance uh, is the fact that it, it uh, discovered Planck's quantum of action, but it just does not apply to all the situations. Uh, which is uh, believed to, to be applied because you have very restricted conditions in which you can apply uh, Planck's law. And that is, as you mentioned in the beginning, if you have a, a surface that radiates, that has all kinds of antennas and not the very uh, specific uh, antennas of atoms. So what you need uh, in order to apply Planck's law is, is something like a metal. Yeah. And so this leads us to the larger question of, okay, so you have this law that says something very specific about thermal emission and temperatures. And the problem is, is that this law gets applied in astrophysics. And so what is the, yeah. what is the confusion and what is the problem that arises when people take this law and misapply it? Like, what does this do to astrophysics? Um, yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like you ask me why not, but but the question is why why should we? I mean, how how can we apply it? So as I said, from a historical perspective or practically, it was very understandable because you have the discovery of this beautiful law, all this revolution in 1900, and at the same time, people were um, wondering about the nature of the sun. Uh, radioactivity was just discovered in um, 1896. And uh, then the first ideas how the energy production process might uh, happen in the sun with, with uh, fusion came even later. So it was clear that, I mean, you just look at the spectrum of the sun and you, you look at, at Planck's law, uh, which had started its career at the time, you say, okay, wow, yeah. Let's apply that. That's obviously true. I mean, I think it was the other way around. People didn't ask in first place for a justification. They just said, okay, that's obviously Planck's law. And somehow we must bring this together because, um, and uh, yeah, what was missing was the, the basic mechanism because you cannot understand it by postulating atoms emitting in this in this way so um there was a big discussion people were discussing even the, if the, the sun was made of carbon why not i mean at the time but 
you later realize that's only you get only the amount of radiation, the only amount of, of energy if you have this uh, source of nuclear fusion, burning hydrogen into helium, which means there is no other, no escape, no other way that it has to be made of uh, hydrogen. And then you're stuck in the trap, you know? I mean, um, uh, you know, it's the Planck spectrum light that's very, very clear. You know that uh, it must be uh, fusion, so it must be hydrogen. So let's do about some. Let's do something about hydrogen. At the same time, um, hydrogen was. I mean, what was the experiments with liquid helium around 1910? Um, people knew also about the the temperature of um, liquid hydrogen, which is something like 33 kelvins. That's minus. Uh, 230 um, um, Celsius. So no way to arrive there. So somehow they try to play with this model of uh, a gaseous plasma. That was the, the starting point. But there is, there is no real justification. I think it's worth pointing out too that, and I, I believe it was Andrews who did the critical temperature stuff, by the way. I believe it was Ooh. Andrews. Uh, was Andrews the critical temperature work? Mm, At any I don't rate, know. could be. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe it's also worth pointing out that there was a terrible feud between two preeminent scientists at the time. One was Eddington and one was mm -hmm. James Jeans. And James mm -hmm. Jeans was sort of the last advocate of the liquid sun. Yes. But unfortunately, Jeans thought that the sun was powered by fission. And mm -hmm. this finding that the sun was comprised primarily of hydrogen and helium mm -hmm. really undermined Jeans' credibility in the field, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And so I see that as the real breaking point where people completely turned away from the idea and, mm -hmm. and followed Eddington into his mathematical mm -hmm. universe. Mm -hmm. can, can, you, uh, can you break down for us how Eddington explains this continuous spectrum? Oh, not really. <laughs> I'm the expert in explaining okay, uh, okay. that. I mean, um, it's a great it's, relay race. Start, right? I mean, it, it's a, if, if you if you go to these uh, texts, you, you you see a lot of uh, thermodynamics and you, you see a lot of theorems and all, a lot of proofs and everything is correct and and, and everything is fine. But th th these kind of of reasoning never goes uh, back to the. Uh, to the preconditions, what what you need to have in order to do all this this argument. So it's a little bit, I mean, uh, <laughs> if you think it's wrong, it's kind of uh, you don't like to to, uh, to to waste your time to follow all the stuff here. I mean, I think it's understandable that he developed this, and 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 uh, what you can observe is um, that astrophysics at the time shifted its uh, line of reasoning really from the experiment and, and observation-based side to this theoretical arguments, what is a system, what is a thermal equilibrium, what is a cavity, what means uh, local thermal equilibrium, and so on and so on. And so you can switch to an um, yeah, it's, it's it's another level of arguing, you know, and um, uh, I guess, like put quite simply, though, Eddington has proposed that the radiation deep inside of the sun is relayed around for m million years or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. slowly yeah. degraded, and somehow the radiation pops mm -hmm. out on the other side with this perfect mm -hmm. black body spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's it's well, what's I mean, bizarre Eddington, about Eddington, it, I guess. That's great worth work. I mean, he was a great theoretical physicist. The Eddington limit, all this pressure and all, all these considerations of, of stars. I mean, that, that's part of the uh, knowledge, much of which we we still rely on. But uh, certainly his approach was that kind of uh, theoretical argument, also the satisfaction that you get from certain things fitting into that, like the uh, luminosity of a star being uh, roughly the third power of its mass and so on and this is what he's probably most famous for mm -hmm. um but but what i wanted to say is that the fundamental difference here the, the fundamental fracture comes down to the idea that the mechanism that eddington proposes shares nothing in common with that of all of the black body work that came before it right there's nothing 
similar about the black body experiment to the Eddington gaseous star. That this mm-hmm. relay mechanism has nothing to do at all with any way that you could come about explaining how yeah. a black body gives off this ra- radiation. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But uh, still, I mean, even if the Eddington's idea came to dominate the um, discussion at the time, there were still huge problems. I mean, this was quantitatively, things still did not uh, add up. And so one interesting personal experience I had uh, I think it was in a book by James Carter, or was it, was it even uh, Stephen Weinberg, the first three minutes? And he, at, um, at one page, he was complaining about, oh, astrophysics, all these astrophysicists are publishing beautiful, um, beautiful pictures of galaxies and so on, but nobody talks about the unsung heroes who dedicated 10 years of their life to understand the opacity of the sun. It was a long time ago when I read this book and I couldn't just make up what he meant with that phrase. Okay, so maybe opacity is something interesting, but I didn't know that there was a problem. But there was a problem. That was, it's it's precisely that what what does not add up, what did not match. Because even if you assume... Uh, if you follow Eddington's argument, you assume this is a cavity, this is in local thermal equilibrium, and so on and so forth. Um, you cannot explain uh, why the sun has a visible surface, and it's very distinct uh, in observation. If you look into a, a giant ball of plasma, it would be, yeah. Kind of transparent at the edges, and and uh, it, it would have a totally different look. So, and it's um, not even transparent to X-rays, right? That's what's really startling. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's another problem. But but you know, there was a huge activity uh, then in the I think starting maybe in the fifties or in, in the sixties and seventies, and uh, a large number of people were uh, working on that model on that model trying to quantitatively determine how can we understand this concretely with substances and so on and, and so forth and if you look that up it's really it's a mess nobody can give you a, a transparent account of this nobody can explain you with um, in an intuitive manner how it works they they come up with Yes, there is the mechanism of the H minus ion, and this and that might contribute a little bit and that. But at the very end, what they do, they set up a model with a huge amount of free parameters of adjustable numbers, and somehow they fix it. But because they had to, they had to do it. There was no other way. Because the the uh, the liquid metallic hydrogen uh, discovery in 1935 wasn't brought together with this. Nobody had the idea uh, that that this could be brought together. Well, they just didn't have the technological ability to create those kinds of pressures and temperatures. From what I understand, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I would say okay, that that's a huge technological problem, but it's not that. I mean, that's, it's a very interesting result in, in 2017 that they realized this liquid metallic hydrogen. Some people discuss it. I'm, I, I don't know. It, it's very interesting. But it's certainly not that now we can believe in Robitaille's model. No, no. It, it makes sense in any case, uh, irrespective of whether you uh, can experimentally realize that at uh, 500 or 700 gigapascal. That's not, that's not the question. The question is just having the idea. And bringing bringing that stuff together, and this was this was uh, Pierre Marie's um, accomplishment. Also, hey, it it's made it be. into the, into the textbooks, I guess. You know, at least for Jupiter and and Saturn, it's at least at least in the textbook I use uh, at the mm-hmm. university, it is mentioned. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that that's correct. I mean, it's it's uh, it's standard knowledge or the standard assumption in planetary science that the, the gaseous planets. Just as a as a consequence, the huge pressure they have in their inside, they that this uh, state of metallic hydrogen is formed. That's correct. So maybe he, I mean, maybe but it's not mentioned with the sun. Learned enough. this and knew this, and that's how he arrived at the idea. But in a star, to to apply that to a star is yeah, something something new. Maybe next year, 
It's funny because I have this, my, the textbook that I use is online. It updates. Sometimes it updates while I'm actually preparing a lecture or something. Like they'll just throw in a new, new uh, paragraph here and there. So, hey, it could happen, you know? You never know. Mm -hmm. I've actually, Pierre's gotten some pretty high level references. Uh, one of the leading plasma physicists, uh, plasma chemists, I can't recall mm -hmm. her name right now. Mm -hmm. uh, she references him uh, very briefly, but very uh, optimistically and says, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the way that we're thinking about stars is going to change very soon. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it could happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that ne this needs to be brought to the attention of astronomers because, I mean, many people just didn't have a chance to see the idea and to appreciate it. That's, yeah. That was my motivation because, I mean, uh, as you say, I mean, he has done already all the work. If you look up his videos, very, very well done. And, and his papers, very accurate, very uh, detailed, argued. But, I mean, you can't convince anyone today. Yeah, look at this 30 papers or look at this uh, 50 hours of, of video because nobody has time. So what, what was needed to bring this all into a concise uh, structure, which is accessible. Yeah, that's what I did thought. You, did you have any problems with the publisher when you were writing the book? Because I, I feel no, it, like... It's, it's, it's on Amazon. Technically, it's self-publishing. -publish, so, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tired of, of <laughs> approaching publisher. I, I have to admit, I mean, my, my uh, first book was... Uh, published with um, Palgrave Macmillan and was very nice uh, collaboration. But I mean, the book business is generally in decline and all the publishers are, are very careful, very defensive, and uh, they prefer to publish one famous name, even with zero content in between. And so you're not... I mean, you have to argue a lot why and this and do you have a platform? And I'm just tired of that. I mean, I think it's um, it's a good method. So we have decided to to go with Amazon in, in this case. And uh, yeah, it's fine. You've gotten yeah. awards in the past, though, for your science writing. I remember I remember looking this up when I was when we did our first interview, and I saw that you had gotten awards for your scientific writing in Germany before. I think that Scientific yes. American uh, mm -hmm. basically declared one of your books as being just a, a visionary explanation mm -hmm. of the problems with physics. And mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. no, it was not. It's not. It was a built a Wissenschaft with is kind of a. Uh, German uh, corresponds to Scientific American and it was an award by by this journal and my, that was my very first book which is uh, uh, Bankrupting Physics is the translation but the original title was a little bit more funny it was From the Big Bang to the uh, Big Madness but something that rhymes you know so um, and that was published by by Springer a scientific publisher so uh all the critics get a little bit of angry because why is this in a why did this arrive at a scientific publisher but but that that helped a lot in the beginning so yeah and it's a little bit a remedy against the crimin the criticism oh this guy just self publishes because he doesn't understand anything and so, okay no here's surprise here's the scientific publisher and uh yeah that's Let's let's look at the content. Yeah, and so with with this book, it's a pretty damning summary of the ways in which astrophysics right now has gone astray. And if yeah, you, I right think now? that well, right the now? the book on the liquid metallic uh, the, the liquid mm -hmm. metallic sun. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I always try to bring the point of this to a to a discrete place where I'm like, look. If our understanding of the sun is incorrect and it is not a gaseous plasma that is releasing a continuous spectrum, then there are other problems in astrophysics 
most mm-hmm. notably the cosmic microwave background, which cannot be produced by the remnants mm-hmm. of the Big Bang. And so mm-hmm. there Which are, is also supposed to come from a gaseous plasma, essentially. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so th- this, to me, seems like the core reason of why Pierre Marie's ideas are so difficult to get accepted. Because if you take the current model of the sun to be a violation of physical laws, you don't just stop at the sun. You end up having to deconstruct the entire platform of cosmology. And that's a really difficult thing. And so I wonder, as you are preparing, as you're, as you're putting this out into the world and as people are starting to read it, what, are, what have the responses been? Have you, have you had conversations with people that are skeptics that are starting to come around? Or is it still that you're generally talking to an audience that has already accepted that there are problems and they're simply deepening their understanding of those problems through the book? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, th- this is an important point. And um, of course, I mean, it should not contribute, but it contributes to the discussion or contributes to the way um, th- th- they look at uh, uh, Pierre Marie's research because he also criticizes the standard model of cosmology. So uh, <laughs> I realized that because back then when I discussed it with my old uh, college friend uh, who is a professor of astronomy, and he also, I mean, was, oh, is this, this, this guy that criticizes the, the cosmic microwave background. So uh, there is definitely a relation. And you are also correct that there is a factual link because, I mean, if you doubt that stars are cavities and can emit as black bodies. So you have to question also this uh, model of the early universe, which is believed to emit as a black body. Well, okay, let's say that there might be other mechanisms. There might be, I mean, I don't, I don't believe in, start, in standard cosmology for other reasons. And uh, you have lots of reasons not to believe standard cosmology. Uh, this is just this is just one reason. And you can attack the um, cosmic microwave background, uh, say from this um, theoretical consideration. Say, look, Kirchhoff's law is not valid. You can't apply that. So we have to restart there. And of course, you can also, uh, going into the details, and, and Pierre Marie has also done this, investigated the satellites, how do they, uh, how, how do they do their data collection, their data cleaning, the uh, removal of the, of the foreground on, and so on. But I, I, at a certain point, I decided just not to open that front line. <laughs> so I mean, I'm speaking kind of confidently to you and your listeners here. Um, it's it, 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 for this book. It was kind of a strategy. I don't believe I'm I'm coward to uh, to say this uh, that there are pl- problems with the cosmic microwave background. But let's say uh, let's do one one battle at a time, mm-hmm. and I think you can make a reasonable argument about the sun based on the uh, critique of Kirchhoff's law. And just um, well, leave that story apart. I might agree. I widely agree with him also with the cosmic microwave background. But as I said, given that uh, cosmology is probably misunderstood, and and the, the more we go back in time, the less we understand. That's kind of obvious. And, and, and who believes in, in kind of nonsense of inflation and ten to the minus? Uh, uh, th- uh, 35 seconds that's that's not reasonable anyway so but i mean i wanted to leave that out from this book from from that discussion because it's not ne- really necessary at this point yeah but i think that's I really wise realized- hmm? i think that's really wise we we made a short video a few, couple of years ago about this topic and mm-hmm. i think it was a mistake for us to include the cosmic microwave background radiation argument because it it, 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 like you say, it's there's the the understanding of these distant early things is open to so much interpretation. And yeah. if we, I wish we'd just left it at the light bulb and the uh, fluorescent light and just talked about mm-hmm. the sun, because mm-hmm. people get lost yeah. in the details when you start yeah, bringing yeah. up the cosmic arguments. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, I, by no means I want to criticize Pierre here, but I mean, he's a great scientist, but maybe he's not always the most prudent and wise person how to sell his science, you know, and, and he is, he's someone dedicated simply to truth as a scientist should be. And that's all fine. But I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I personally wouldn't have attacked at the same time, the model of the sun and the cosmic microwave background. And he, he went still further saying that, oh, that also just proves the big bang. Okay. I mean, the cosmic microwave background is taken as one piece of evidence, what is called the big bang model. But I mean, this is an, an entire new discussion or battlefield. If you want go back to a uh, steady state and get back to Hubble and uh, how is Hubble redshift. Last time we talked about my book about the different interpretation of the Hubble redshift. I mean, you have lots of, uh, lots of good reasons to, to be skeptical of standard cosmology. But I mean, if you, I mean, uh, if you attack everything, it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it, it's more difficult from a sociological point of view. Yeah, uh, it's very difficult. I, I, I don't think myself, anyone's probably ever... I myself am uh, uh, making also th this error because I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical of particle physics, I think for good reason, but someone might also say, oh, Okay, answer is just just doesn't accept modern physics as a whole. Why I don't know why. It's um, I don't think anyone's ever fought two enormous fronts in a war and come out successful before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, you want to be you want to be honest. Okay, I mean, uh, I, I I think that his uh, his his technical also his technical criticism of the of the big bang is is sound uh, no sorry of, of the cosmic micro of background is sound i think this i mean th these papers are from a scientific point of view very well written very well researched and and th there's nothing i, I can uh, criticize about well he offers um, a solution too which is pretty cool uh, a lot of times critics yeah, don't the, the have ocean. solutions. Yeah, I mean, yeah. whether he's right or not, at least he's trying to propose a way that we could be observing mm -hmm. this. And, you know, he makes yeah. a very good point. Most people are under the impression that we observe the CMB far away from the Earth. And that's really just not true. We, we had a differential instrument that was capable of looking at mm -hmm. the stuff in front, the stuff behind. And then, of course, you know, so you already don't have a direct measurement of the CMB with this W mm -hmm. map project yeah yeah yeah, yeah and yeah, then yeah. and then you forms. you have yeah. all this 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 uh noise removal where you literally take out the brightest thing which is the galaxy and uh if you walk through if you look at these images as they're successively processed it, it's just like what are we looking at at the end of the day it's it's very yeah, very I mean, fuzzy. particular if you take out as background noise a signal which is one thousand more strong uh, stronger than the, the the one thing you're looking for that's that's kind of strange and, yeah. and he as a as an applied scientist coming from that uh medical uh experience where things have to work yeah and you have to care about your patients you, you're not doing that they're that i mean you wouldn't do such a thing in uh, something if you want if you want to cure a patient okay just removing one a signal of 1000 but if you're a scientist you can do that yeah i mean if if you open a more general perspective here i think uh yeah i see i see a general problem in modern post war uh, science that you have these um institutional big science communities a lot of people working, no doubt that sometimes it's necessary, but uh, that's it's necessarily it kind the kind of group think you are superficially uh, brushing uh, over the the fundamental problem problems in uh, in many cases, and you're always more prone to the discovery than to really clean examination of your uh, possible systematic errors, which is something very frustrating. So I see a general tendency uh, with a lot of projects that 
people have discovered or things that are established, but at the very end, it, it cannot be that complicated. It cannot be that that way. So we have we have established a scientific culture that is, um, yeah, very likely to get to wrong established results uh, on, on really on, on that huge scale. Yeah, that's that's something I addressed more in my book on scientific culture, if I may say this at the point. And at the same time, if I may totally ruin my my reputation here. So <laughs> I, I I would doubt a lot of these discoveries. I, I think there is something wrong with the CMB. I also think there is something wrong. Uh, probably also with gravitational waves and, and probably also with the neutrino business. So, yeah. It's interesting uh, how this... A lot of your, your readers and listeners can turn off now. <laughs> I doubt that very much. Uh, but I, I wanted to say it is interesting how this data, remo- this data processing business has become very standard, right? This mm-hmm. Im- like you know, the image of the black hole, right? I think that the, yeah. the number of pixels that are used to generate that are absolutely dwarfed by the actual image that was obtained. I mean, it's an unbelievable work of data processing. I just can't imagine doing that amount of image processing in a biological paper and getting it past a mm-hmm. sync, like even into a really bad journal, let alone a good journal. But this is mm-hmm. absolutely standard fare in astrophysics at this point for some reason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, not only processing. I mean, you're putting a huge uh, truckload of theoretical assumptions uh, into that. That's that's the real problem, and that's a problem here, as I see in the in the M eighty seven image you just mentioned, and that's a huge problem also in particle physics that you have this lots of lots of theoretical assumptions, which which is makes it almost impossible to do a clean separation between between what is obs- genuine observation and yeah hidden uh, stuff uh, uh, that has entered the background at the back door by by theory yeah well the interesting thing is that it creates a very strange condition because there's complex mathematics that are what, what mathematics? Complex, complex. yes. Yeah, so very, very intricate, complicated equations that are accessible to a small population that has trained to be able to work with them. Like the mathematics of particle physics, the mathematics of generating a black hole image, these are things that are accessible to the select few that are working in them. And granted, there's 10,000 people that are at CERN or whatever. However, the the objection that Pierre Marie presents is not really mathematical in nature; it's theoretical, and so it's phenomenological. It's phenomenological. It's basically being able to look at it, to step outside of the mathematics, and to say, "Hey, do our assumptions make sense?" Because we see uh-huh. in in science that you can generate mathematical equations that describe something really, really well to progressive, mm-hmm. progressively increasing specificity. And they don't necessarily have explanatory power. They might, to some select group of people that are able to visualize and conceptualize what the math is saying because they have such fluency with it. But mm-hmm. for somebody who's standing on the outside who's looking in and is taking a 30,000 foot view of what is actually being described at the mathematics, it's easier to be able to say that, hey, hold on a second, I don't know that your assumptions actually make sense. And it is an attack on such a fundamental level that I think people have an immediate reaction against it because they're like, well, how could we have made such a mistake? We obviously didn't make the mistake. Look at all this math that we have that supports what it is Mm -hmm. that we're saying. And that's Mm -hmm. really the challenge because we live in a time where mathematics is the primary language in which all of science is done. If you cannot, like we've been having a lot of conversations about consciousness, and if you cannot put your idea into mathematics, it is viewed as being not a worthy idea of consideration. Amateur. Yeah, yeah, purely. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that might be one of the greatest challenges for Pierre-Marie, which is that he's not particularly 
uh, enamored with the mathematics. He he mm. talks in a theoretical, physical way where, sure, the equations enter into the consideration, but what he's saying is is on top of that. And he's sweet. like, you don't need yeah. to know the math to understand what it is that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. seems to be something that people don't really want to have to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of interesting stuff you said here. I I agree in part, but let me add one thing which I think is um, is important and makes a difference. There is a big difference between difficult math and complicated math. Mm. And I don't m mind math to be difficult. I'm happy with uh, differential geometry and torsion and connections or or uh, quaternions and, and, and S3 and all that stuff. Uh, that's fine. That's difficult. The math that is applied in this big science culture, which is dominant in today's science, and that applies to particle physics and, and gravitational waves and, and cosmic microwave background and whatever. It's not difficult in that sense. It's just complicated that, well, known techniques, but rather banal if you uh, consider the, the, the technical level of, of mathematical difficulty. But you have a lot, a lot of free parameters. And that's the key, the key element, in my view, to distinguish good from bad theories. What is your number of free parameters? And what is your number of independent observation? And uh, in particle physics, you have lots of these free primary parameters, and that's what you see also, and um, uh, see also in this standard solar model. These guys need a lot of assumptions, a lot of hypothetical, um, yeah, uh, screws they can adjust uh, and, and fix. And then uh, they they build up their model, and this is the epistemological uh, problem here in first place. Uh, I wouldn't mind if they uh, if they use mathematics, and to a certain degree, of course, you have to do mathematics, um, or you have to do calculations. Yeah, I myself thought that. Uh, okay, also Pierre's model, I mean, and you correctly mentioned his very intuitive way of thinking, which all the great, <laughs> a lot of great physicists were, had this kind of thinking, think about Niels Bohr and so on. Um, but sometimes, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't hurt if you add a little bit mathematical stuff. So I tried to, because I, I, I mean, I want also to, to, to falsify the model. I want to test it. So I, I tried and, and ask myself the question, could all this add up quantitatively at the chromosphere, at the, um, at the photosphere? Because uh, you need uh, a much higher density. So what about the density and how, at what point uh, the uh, hydrogen is changing its structures? What is the necessary pressure that uh, to form that liquid state? And I did a little bit of that uh, calculation. Of course, I mean, this is just one man show. Um, you would, to develop that kind of model, uh, you would need, uh, or, or, or to do a fair comparison, so to speak. I mean, you would, some, would need some more doctorants and, and, and PhDs who, who uh, test this and, and try to model it. But um, yeah. Uh, the 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 starting point of a revolution or the starting point is always, uh, I said you, you correctly pointed to this. It's it's always an intuitive way of thinking. Yeah, it's an intuitive uh, idea starting from Newton. Oh wow, the gravity of the Earth is related to the gravity that attracts the Moon. That's in a completely intuitive idea, but. And the following, you need an, a lot of mathematics to justify it. And, and of course, I mean, let's be frank. I mean, there are some, I mean, many open questions which need to be checked, which need also to be um, calculated quantitatively uh, in, in Pierre Marie's model of liquid metallic hydrogen. I think this still needs to be done. Yeah? 
but if if no one knows about the model so it will never start and it's, i think that's really necessary mm. we had uh, michael levin who's a biologist doing some incredible regenerative medicine work and he pointed out that the hallmark of a great theory is what it allows you to do and i think that we're moving into the phase of paradigm shift with the sun and i don't know who the original philosopher was that that laid out this criteria i thought it was james jeans for a while but nastia couldn't find the reference so i don't know who it was maybe somebody in the comments can tell you, me you you said william james not james jeans oh sorry william <laughs> William James, I'm sorry. I thought it was William James. I don't know who said this, but essentially in a paradigm shift, everybody at first says, no, this can't be the answer. It doesn't work. And then as soon yeah. as it's shown that the theory does work, they say, oh, well, we kind of knew that already. <laughs> and then the final stage is, yeah, well, not only did we know that already, but it doesn't really matter. And no, so sorry. That's, th 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 I'm sorry. I have to, I have to correct it. It's Isn't it Thomas Gold? I yeah, I don't I don't know, but I think that did it's I, say it backwards? I think you did. I think that it's crazy. It doesn't matter. We knew that already. Mm -hmm. Because we knew that already is the final stage of acceptance. We've always known this all along. We've believed this. It's not a problem. Okay, well it doesn't really change what I'm trying to say here, which <laughs> is that at some point, and Michael Levin pointed this out, is that you have to you have to show how it matters, right? And mm -hmm. the obvious question is what sort of technologies could we be barking up the wrong tree with mm. if we have this vision of the sun. And the, the obvious one is that we are working on this fantastic new energy system called fusion technology, right? And mm -hmm. we're promised that we're going to harness the power of the sun here on Earth. Now, the problem, as I see it, is that if we have the wrong conception of the sun's material composition, then we're going to be trying the wrong methods to go about that task what do you think about about the future of fusion do you think that that will be impacted by this not sure i'm not sure i agree totally here um i mean that the sun's power originates from nuclear fusion from hydrogen to helium is out of question no the question is how is it how is it generated? there are people a question even this but pierre and i are not part of part of these people um i don't i don't think i don't think Pierre would agree with that huh I mean, my my personal conversations with Pierre, I, I think that he he understands that the uh, that there's more promising avenues for fusion that that involve no, 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 the no, understanding. No, yeah, let me finish. I mean, I mean, the very process at the very end must be fusion from hydrogen to helium. Of course, there is there are some interesting aspects of how can you boost uh, the mechanism which is believed to be a lead to nuclear fusion because i mean you, you can't claim you you exactly understand something which has happened at 15 million degrees and that pressures we never uh, were able to uh, build in in the lab uh there are a couple of interesting um results or let's say it's even a field it's called low energy nuclear reactions um i I really did not dive into that very much. I think it's interesting. I think that some there might be some modifications in in, in ways that you get um, uh, nuclei easier to uh, to fuse to fusion, but um, and you can hypothesize, I, and I think that's what what Pierre does that. Uh, the inter the, the, the lattice and the interstitial atoms they they kind of um, catalyze. Uh, there might be a catalyzing effect to fusion, and I I think um, what 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 he thinks is that the the region where the fusion actually occurs is uh, much larger than is commonly believed to be, which could be. I mean, one thing is that um, if you rewrite, let's say, the entire model of the sun, you have to, uh, you have to do a different layering, what, what is the density depending on the, on the location, on the radius. And of course, you arrive at a different picture where the nuclear fusion happens. And on top of that, he also believes that there might be some extra mechanism that eases fusion in the more outer parts. I'm not sure I, I agree with him. And let's say I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to add all these 
uh, controversial issues to the key message that I really convinced is correct and needs to be uh, put out. And so I wouldn't, um, yeah, I, I haven't just made made my mind up on that question very profoundly. I, I guess my, my point is there's two pieces of data that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. One is that there has been a single group centered around a NASA consortium in Ohio that did mm -hmm. some lattice confinement fusion experiments. And mm -hmm. they appear to have stopped for whatever reason. And I can't really strike up a conversation with these people. They've scattered to the wind. And they mm -hmm. did demonstrate that fusion was possible under confinement conditions at mm -hmm. ambient temperatures, which is incredible because mm -hmm. the fusion, we, we mm -hmm. see a fusion headline every couple of years. Oh, we're very close. You know, we've yeah, achieved it's kind of, this, it's in, that. It's, unfortunately, it's kind of poison that, that field since um, 1989, this, this Fleischmann and Pons story and a lot of a lot of controversy so it's 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 kind of poisoned <laughs> yeah and the fact of the matter is that there uh, really hasn't I have, I have kept my hands off that, that yeah uh, well, there really hasn't what's, been do you know the fleischman and Pond uh -huh. story well there uh -huh. there really hasn't been progress mm -hmm. is the thing right mm -hmm. it's been fusion yeah. research has been going on for 80 yeah. years yeah. there's yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. really been progress and the other piece of evidence though that i wanted to throw out there really quickly is the observations of heavy metals decaying that are, are short-lived heavy metals in certain stars. And I'm thinking of Shabilsky's star in particular. Okay. And uh -huh. the funny thing is that astronomers recognize this as being a valid result, but uh -huh. their immediate go-to is like, oh, well, it's aliens dumping their waste in the sun, as opposed <laughs> to considering that, well, maybe there is fusion actually happening in the outer regions of the star. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What, what's, the, what's the Fleischmann and Pons controversy? I don't, I don't know much about this. Oh, there the, were the two scientists claiming that they have observed nuclear fusion fusion at um, kind of room temperature, I guess. So and was and they went to the press conference before publishing. That was the main criticism in the following. But I'm not I'm not competent to comment on that. Mm. I, I'm just saying that sociologically that has been a big uh, issue in physics, and and it's kind of I mean. Let's say it's it's very something very important potentially. It's very costly, a lot of uh, money going into that, and that's all. Uh, everything is detrimental to true science. So, yeah. in a way, cold fusion has a bad name. Off no, from that I discussion, but I don't want to, to dismiss. I mean, I definitely think it's possible that we 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 haven't discovered yet something important in this field. It's just that again, I don't want to add this this other battle which is not an essential one to the battle for the correct model of of the sun which is liquid metallic hydrogen it, it's not essential to the argument but i think it's important that people recognize that mm -hmm. our models of fusion are inherently based on our understanding of the sun and that if we have a better understanding of the sun we can only improve our process of fusion and yes. maybe that's what it will take, right? Maybe that's what it will take for people to say, okay, mm -hmm. this model works better than this model. Because mm -hmm. I, I wanted to add to that. When we talk to people who are engineers and technologists about different ways of interpreting physics, where, you know, a lot of our conversations come down to atomics because that's what our other channel is about. And... Almost everyone universally says the models that we have right now are good enough. There's no motivation for needing to change it. And I understand it from the standpoint of a technologist because the technologist, we have a friend who's an engineer and he has parameterized this for us really well, which is that like you have an equation and it allows you to do something. And as long as your equation allows you to do the thing that you're interested in doing, he builds bridges and railroads. There's not a pressure for changing the equations. And so I think yeah. that what Shiloh is really driving at is he's trying to say that, look, most people are resistant to a change in theory because the attitude is it's good enough. We, need, we can do everything that we need to do with it. And so why bother changing it? And so when you can add this extra technological element to it where you're like, look, this is the model that we have. It's, it's wrong. not really working very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's. I mean, your friend is perfectly right. I mean, in, in the in the context of 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 technology, 
if it works, it's fine. And you have also this test of practice. That means the, the bridges do not um, do not break and they people do not die. Yeah. And that's what I mean. But on the other hand, you have the same mechanism of, okay, the model is working, the model is working. And you use that also in a scientific context of fundamental understanding of physics, where there is no place for such a philosophy. Okay. It's Bruce G. Charlton, uh, who said that, I mean, if, uh, if uh, supersymmetry would be tested, the, the, the planes would crash and burn. Okay, <laughs> but but you have no. no in, in, unfortunately, if you're dealing with supersymmetry or with strings, there are no no planes that crash and burn and falsify your theory. Those, these people are allowed to distance themselves from from the evidence from falsifiability. That's the danger, and that's one of the things I outline also. The the different thinking in post-war physics and pre-war physics and pre-war we had these theories and we wanted to understand how it works with possibly zero uh, free parameters and on the other hand we have these model builders which were extremely successful in applied science and technology but uh, they, they they had to uh, they had to get things to work you know and but this is something entirely different and, and at the sun actually there is a little bit um both elements but because you uh, understanding our stars and the universe is something of fundamental science on the other hand there is this link to technology we know that there is something that works or also fusion works let's say we have realized the uh, fusion bomb even it's not a nice thing and and uh be it that it never happens that we see the effect but uh, uh yeah uh, possibly possibly there is a link here and i also agree that that there is not much progress in, in conventional fusion uh there is once in a while they have a big pref press conference and announce an incredible advance of their technology but the last sentence uh, of the comment is always until we We'll be able to realize the first uh, reactor. It it will take decades, mm -hmm. and that constantly gets pushed farther and farther. And the press releases start to get progressively less and less accurate because there was the big announcement. I think mm -hmm. that it was just earlier this year that the National Ignition Facility had gotten to this point mm -hmm. where they were starting to generate power. And it was mm -hmm. so promising until you started to look deeper into the mechanics of the system and mm -hmm. you realized that it needed something like 300 times more input than it was producing. Mm -hmm. And so if you looked just at the moment of the reaction, mm -hmm. the statement mm -hmm. was accurate that they were producing power. Mm -hmm. But if you mm -hmm. looked at the entire infrastructure of the facility, they were still not producing power. And that wasn't how the press releases were written. And so it always feels like it's being somewhat misrepresented. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think the, the strength of Pierre's model will eventually come down to what it lets you do. And I would mm -hmm. love to see more, I, I would just love to see someone who is technologically focused take it and run with it. Because if... Mm -hmm. If it is true that our model of the sun is incorrect and all of our fusion technology is based on the model of the sun, mm -hmm. then how can we possibly get to any kind of post-scarcity mm -hmm. power generation mm -hmm. if, we, if we start with these faulty assumptions? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I must admit that I find a little bit myself in the position now commenting on nuclear fusion, which part of it I did not expect. And I admit also, I'm not... The expert. I mean, I, I I'm a physicist, and I can talk about, but I, I didn't want to want to make stupid or superficial statements and on on recent developments. So, um, yeah, I mean, you hope that that might be the breakthrough. Frankly, I don't believe that this specific uh, topic of nuclear fusion will be the breakthrough that. Uh, that advances Pierre's theory it could be, but I would hope for uh, for other evidence mm. that we might gather from uh, in favor of his model. Yeah, well, an alternative. Can you talk imagine? about talk about the problems and also the 
the the main arguments people are why people don't believe or or they the one thing one thing for example is i mean you say that okay uh you have liquid metallic hydrogen and they just google and say okay we have a pressure of i don't know a very very small pressure on the uh in the solar uh, atmosphere from Wikipedia, and that doesn't add up. So it can, it must be nonsense. Okay, but this is this is, for example, one of the superficial arguments we should also maybe maybe get to. Can you imagine any other technologies that might be impacted by the discovery? not easy to not easy to answer i i don't see really i mean what you mentioned correctly could be technology i mean the, if these experiments are uh, continue with liquid metallic hydrogen if they are able to produce it if they are able to produce it one day in larger quantities i mean of course it will be a very interesting substance some people talk about that might be a rocket fuel um with high energy density that's certainly true mm. i still suspect there is a long way until we arrive yeah. there maybe science is powered by artificial intelligence but the usual way my guess would be that will take quite a time so my hope is that uh you will just find evidence from the scientific the purely scientific uh, community yeah without too much technology involved i mean what you could i mean what you could observe is um uh comets bouncing into the uh, sun i have yeah, reviewed that mentioned that briefly in my book comments are Comets are, of course, the new uh, solar missions are something, even if they do not come very close to the sun, so we cannot expect definite uh, evidence uh, for this model from these new missions either, unfortunately. Well, I and mean, the comets, the comets, they threaten the temperature of the coronal atmosphere. Is that, is that the contradiction that you're pointing to? Well, this is, I mean, uh, the, the corona temperature is a contradiction the astrophysicists have long learned to live with and <laughs> to make right. up all kinds of absurd explanations. So, uh, now what I mean is, I mean, the key, the key element which distinguishes the standard model and uh, the liquid metallic hydrogen model is really density. And there must be a huge difference in density. Now, just to keep in mind, there is no direct way you can ever measure the density uh, at, the, at the photosphere. So uh, usually it's assumed to be uh, something 10 to the minus seven grams per cubic centimeter. But uh, what we need is, um, yeah, uh a million times higher or something okay you need the the transition between um molecular hydrogen the liquid form of molecular hydrogen it's uh, still a liquid it's compressed it's denser denser than a gas but it's not yet metallic yeah if you go from the molecular hydrogen liquid hydrogen uh if you apply huge pressure then you eventually change the structure of the atoms and molecules and they organize themselves in an entirely different manner and be become a metal. I, I used the analogy of a uh, family lifestyle. If you have a, a molecule with your partner and the kids, the electrons moving around, and then you uh, transfer it to that uh, communist uh, style lifestyle uh, we have only this basic structure as a lattice and the, the kids are free to go anywhere. There are no family bounds anymore. The electron, electrons are uh, allowed to move freely. This is the, the characteristic of the, of the metal structure. 
And that's, um, you need, of course, a huge amount of activation energy. That means, again, a huge pressure to arrive there. And the question is, um, how can we make up a consistent model that explains the transition, uh, the phase transition to from the uh, from the gaseous uh, molecular hydrogen to the liquid metal hydrogen, which is basically the chromosphere, and then to the liquid metallic no, to the liquid metallic hydrogen, which is below the photosphere. And uh, this is still a challenge. I, I think I did some preliminary steps in that little paper. I um, I. Um, uh, published and uh, as accompanying <laughs> research, but still a lot needs to be done there to, um, to address these uh, densities quantitatively. And, uh, but what can happen coming back to observations, uh, if you uh, go very close to the sun, be it with a, a comet or a dedicated mission, I mean, you should see a difference whether you pass by uh, a liquid with uh, density, say, 0.5 uh, grams per cubic centimeters or a very thin gas, 10 to the minus 7 grams per centimeter. You should see a difference. I mean, in its trajectory, break up like in the orbit? Break or? up. Hmm? In, the, in the orbit? Is that what you mean? Yeah, in the orbit, uh, in the sense that if it's too dense, it would just break up. Okay, mm. so but we are talking about only a couple of, but this this makes only a difference at a distance of a couple of thousand kilometers, which is not very much. The entire sun is seven hundred thousand kilometers, and the closest distance the the recent missions uh, will reach is something like ten solar radio that is 7 million uh, kilometers so these will not these kind of missions will not give direct evidence but what we could try in a future mission is purposefully throw something into the sun an instrument that at shortly before its death before its destruction will send data saying that oh the density is much higher than expected and that mm. could be a possible proof of the theory can you elaborate a little bit on the density problem? Because you made a reference to the fact that if you start to consider the liquid metallic hydrogen model and then you go to Wikipedia and the first line about the sun is the fact that it's not sufficiently dense at the surface mm -hmm. in order to have these structures. Can you kind of lay out the, the controversy there? Yes. I mean, if you have, I mean, if you start from this gaseous model, which is the established solar model, um, you need a lot of different um, uh, preconditions. Um, as a matter of fact, you can't observe a lot of things. The only thing you observe is the radiation that we can be pretty sure that the temperature on the solar surface is uh, slightly less than 6,000 degrees. Okay, but there is no direct measure of density. You don't go there and measure the density. So in uh, assuming this and that and this and that in order to be consistent, solar physicists have established that the density must be very low. That is 10 to the minus 7, as I said. Now, um, if you uh, overturn this model and say, no, 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 it's liquid metallic hydrogen. I mean, you don't keep all the other assumptions. You don't have to, but you have to be consistent in your way. Okay. So, um, of course, um, when you need, when you make a transition from, um, uh, from the gaseous state of hydrogen or the mo molecular state and, uh, to this liquid metallic hydrogen, you necessarily uh, have this pressure of several hundred gigapascal and you necessarily have a density of, I made the calculation, you can do that pretty much from first principles, but you end up in the region of something like 500, uh, now we are kilograms per cubic meter, sorry for the change, 500 kilograms for a cubic meter. That's very intuitive. It's, it's the half of water, half the density of water. And that would be 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter. But we are far away, of course, from that model. 
Okay, but it's not falsified by Wikipedia because it's seven orders of magnitude out there because it's just another model and you, you still have, don't have uh, the direct, uh, the possibility of direct measurements, but you must assume this uh, in the liquid metallic hydrogen model that the density is one, uh, roughly one million times uh, higher than in the in the standard model, and that also, of course, creates another series of problems or a series, let's say, more general, a series of boundary conditions you have to address, and you at the very end you have to be consistent with, such as the uh, the total mass of the sun, uh, which is known, which we wouldn't put in doubt at this point. But uh, one problem which is obviously arising is okay. Uh, if the standard model says the density is very uh, is very low at the surface, it's very high at the inside. And if we are starting with a higher density at the surface, we uh, should not and, and must not have that high density at the inside of the sun. Okay, which in turn uh, tells us something ab about the conditions of nuclear fusion, just as a sideline, you know. But what you need is an entire new model how the change, the density increases as we go down beyond the surface. And frankly, I don't have worked out a complete solution. It might be I even disagree a little bit with Pierre, who who uh, likes to assume that it's it's really kind of constant the density. And I would rather say mm, it's difficult if you make calculations. I wouldn't. Ex I would expect the density to go up, but maybe not go up that uh, steep as, as foreseen in the standard model. Yeah. But that's one of the key questions we have to test. You know, one, one question that's come up is how universal are these findings? Should we expect this model to be applied to all stars? What about really small dwarf stars? What about really big stars? Is this something that you can see becoming a universal perspective, or is this particular to our sun? Uh, yeah, that's that's an important question. Um, yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, what we assume uh, uh, how stars are working is largely uh, based on what we believe the sun, how the sun works. And... Uh, that in turn, I mean, these are in first place, I think, the shock waves uh, or another another series of shock waves, Pierre's theory, is sending into other uh, fields of physics because, uh, of course, conventional astronomers like their models of the stars and they don't want them to be destroyed. So, again, we have not only from cosmology, I mean, even if you... If you um, if you're a standard astronomer, uh, um, you assume that the model of the sun is correct. And of course, you have similar stars. You believe that they're working similar to the sun. And, and you, have, you would have to do a lot of rewriting of these models. I'm, I'm not saying that um, uh, it's not possible. And, and I'm not, I, I also admit that. Um, I haven't gone into the details on that, so again, I want to do want don't want to say stupid things here about solar models or, or star models. Um, some things, of course, are beyond doubt and should not be um, attacked. Such as, of course, there are um, red giants, which uh, in which fusion from helium to other more heavy element occurs. No doubt about that. No doubt that a, um, a maximum size of a star exists. But, you know, um, uh, astrophysics astronomy is a very observational science. And, and uh, we're still far from understanding from first principles many... Um, many of the processes that actually occur in stars. So I think, but this is very intuitive and people, some people may say it's, it's superficial, but I, 
I think it's possible to reinterpret this, but of course you have uh, you have to expect a huge uh, resistance from from this kind from this uh, science. That I mean, if you if you put the model of the sun in in question, of course, I mean you have to rewrite something of the of the assumptions uh, astronomers are in love with. Yeah. Mm. To bring this back to something that Shiloh was saying earlier, which is Shabilsky's star that has all of these anomalous, heavy elements inside of it. Something mm -hmm. that Pierre has also done for the sun is he's gone through and he's been looking at the elemental composition of the, I think it's the photosphere that he's been looking at, where he's been finding all of these, mm -hmm. he's been finding chemistry in it and signatures yeah. of these mm -hmm. reactions that are happening. And so mm -hmm. it seems like the density problem is needs to be addressed because if the chromosphere and the photosphere are as rarefied as the current models say, there's not a way of accounting for the chemistry that's happening because in order to have mm -hmm. chemistry, you have to have the molecules actually in dense enough conditions to be able to yeah. react. And so yeah. this creates a really difficult a, a difficult problem because like you said i'm just I, i'm just now processing the the density problem which is that if you start with a much denser surface of the sun then you must mm -hmm. by necessity end up with a much denser center of the sun and so that seems like mm -hmm. the maybe. biggest well maybe how do you not end up with a denser interior density is a strange th thing inside of no. droplets <laughs> right uh it's very strange, and uh, and then you get into this with gravity as well, because yeah. all the atoms are pulling on each other from all directions, and uh, you can end up with like even in the inside of our our own planet, mm -hmm. there's constant discussion about the wandering density of the interior and how there's these different layers, and um, it, it's not totally clear how that plays out. Let's let's forget about let's forget about the moment of the inside we know almost little about the yeah, inside because yeah, it's it's yeah. not accessible but i'm very glad you brought up the point because it would would have been a shame if you, if you forgot that it's very very important what you said about the chemistry and the physics because this is of course as you said related to the key question density you know and uh if the standard model is correct then we would have a very low density. We would have a conventional atomic physics of a hot and heated gas and so on with all the consequences. And one fantastic piece of evidence Pierre has revealed is he went to the details of these uh, spectra and identified the this and that spectral lines and said, I, look at this, it doesn't add up. That that contradicts the standard model. If if the standard model is correct, this um, transition line should be present, and but the other one should be present too. But, and you find only one in the chromospheric spectrum. There are lots of lots of lots of contradictions here, and the solution indeed can only be no. We're not talking about a a gas here. This is condensed matter. This is already a substance which I propose is. Uh, a compressed um, liquid, still still a molecular liquid of hydrogen, but uh, a liquid. And then you have condensed matter. And of course, you ha don't have the usual physics of atomic transitions because it's an entirely new situation if all the matter sticks together. So you have more chemical, uh, more th of these reactions of, of chemical type of which he identified a lot. So this spectroscopic evidence is a very a very um, important part of what we might hope for, which which can falsify the standard model and 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 provide evidence for the for his model. And I, when I I admit that when I started writing the book, my first draft of the content was leaving that that spectroscopy just out because I thought, uh, you can't uh, you can't present that that's too advanced. But then I realized no no. It's not possible. It's so important. And well, I'm quite glad simply, that it's just another example of 
the empirical studies on Earth don't match the theoretical understanding of the star. It's I, very similar to the black body experiment at the end of the yeah. day. I would go farther than that. And I would say that there's an oddity because what Pierre points out is that in the spectrum of the sun, these mm-hmm. lines that indicate chemistry are very conveniently not annotated. And so not, he's going, not annotated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so he's basically yeah. going through and he's like, look at this spectrum. We have mm-hmm. these lines that are identified because they are the elements that are allowed to be there mm-hmm. on the basis of the gaseous model. And there's mm-hmm. all of these other lines that are not identified. Mm-hmm. And when you actually look at the experiments that have been done on Earth that allow you to characterize mm-hmm what these lines are, you suddenly end up with all of these states of matter that cannot be there in a gas. And I guess the thing that for me is the most difficult to understand is why do you have to have this increased density to account for these extra special, these these extra spectral lines? Like, what is it about Uh the property of gas versus liquid that allows you to have the lines in liquid, but not in gas. Can gas not react in order to produce these lines, or is it the abundance that is what is what what is telling? Mm-hmm. I hope I understood. I hope I understood your question. But uh, simply, uh, hydrogen would never form that liquid metallic state if it's not forced to, because it's much more convenient from an energetic point of view. You have uh, 13 electron volts energy gain if just it maintains, uh, the, the nucleus just maintains its uh, its electron very close. So uh, uh, changing that mo- uh, atomic or molecular structure into a metallic one needs uh, a lot of, of uh, investing, uh, a lot of invested energy. So you're doing that only under huge pressure. So if there is, uh, we have this condensed matter that emits the light, we need that huge pressure and in turn, of course, the, the high density. And as, as uh, Michael said long before, uh, you see that, that beautiful rainbow spectrum. And for that reason, it must be condensed matter. Single atoms or single molecules won't do. We need that state of liquid metallic hydrogen or semi-metallic with the uh, changes in, in this in the lattice structure. So, but we need that structure and the surface, what is commonly known the photosphere is indeed the uh, boundary of liquid metallic hydrogen where it becomes uh, um, uh, again molecular above the boundary, becomes again molecular hydrogen. And that's the the basic distinction, the basic feature of the of the solar surface, and uh, once you once you realize that uh, model, I think it's very also very beautiful. Again, going back to the very basics, the first observation, as he said, oh look, we have this beautiful rainbow spectrum. Okay, that for that uh, you need condensed matter. But on top, what was the first very important discovery about the sun? It was the Fraunhofer lines, yeah? The missing, these black lines, which were missing in the continuous pattern. And how do you explain that? Okay, you explain that because above this condensed matter of liquid metallic hydrogen, you have this layer, this ocean of still very dense, but molecular hydrogen, with other atoms, of course, which absorb, which cause that Fraunhofer spectrum. Okay, so um, and I think it's it's so at this point so obvious that uh, uh, the liquid metallic hydrogen model explains so conveniently this very the very existence of these two um, basic observations the rainbow spectrum and the missing Fraunhofer lines. Because at the very end, you don't have an explanation for this. In yeah, if, I, if I could model. You like maybe so together. A lot of parameters and, and add this and that, but that's the very, very basic uh, observational facts which are which speak in favor of, of, of his model. Mm-hmm. 100%. If I could just sew together your question a little bit with this, I think what it comes down to is catalytic behavior. 
And the idea that mm -hmm. these reactions that are observed in the spectra, they require mm -hmm. uh, catalysis with th these condensed matter states. And condensed matter inherently reflects a greater density, right? Because of the packing mm -hmm. of it. Yes. And it kind of mm -hmm. leads into the last thing I really wanted to touch on. Uh, at least my last question. I don't know if you have more questions, but the the nature of lattices and liquids seems to be poorly understood in general because a lot of people will say, oh, it's liquid. And then you're also saying it's a lattice. How can a liquid have a lattice? And this, of course, brings up my favorite chemical, which is water. And so maybe we could yeah. just talk for a minute about how in the heck a liquid all of a sudden looks like mm -hmm. carbon soot in its arrangement. Yeah, yeah, very important. Glad you you brought that up because that was one point. I admit, I also struggled a little bit, uh, especially in in the beginning. How the heck could that liquid have uh, a structure? And it can, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, if you uh, one thing is we know very little about very dense matter, but um, if if you pack matter denser and denser, I mean it still likes to have its minimum energy configuration. So even if there is motion, even if it's very hot, even if the motion is random uh, in the first place, um, you still have a, and be it only a correlation, but you have this pattern uh, qualities um, even at the statistical level, you know, uh, even if, Everything is moving very fast when you have high temperature. But if you take uh, a picture, so to speak, for one nanosecond or microsecond, you would notice a correlation between the location of the respective um, atoms. And, and that is that means you, you have that these patterns, and you even have probably different kinds of patterns. Now it gets complicated again. But well, we can observe this, this in is water. Really complication to be an yeah, but, not but we can see this, right? In the laboratory mm -hmm. with, with AFM yeah. studies, you can actually see this uh, hexagonal mm -hmm. lattice appear at, mm -hmm. at interfaces, essentially, and it mm -hmm. persists for several yes. Debye lengths out from the surface that there is this mm -hmm. hexagonal pattern, which really yeah. ultimately comes down to electrostatics and packing density. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can simplify it that way, there, there's s essentially an easiest way to fit these molecules in. And this is, it, it mm -hmm. comes out to look a lot like the graphene lattice, which was used for all of the black body yes. studies. Yes, 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 yes. That, that, that's how things at the very end come together. Once you realize that um, carbon is the chemical cousin of hydrogen, they are similar in many respects. So what was always taken as the primary example for a black body only there is only carbon no there is also hydrogen which behaves similarly and then it things are are getting together and you, you see the you see the great picture here yeah and yeah. there's almost no end you know my all of my academic work uh was centered on new structures that water can form under different pressures and uh, really mm -hmm. just physical constraints. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that every day we're discovering new structures that water can form under extreme environmental conditions. And it's not a secret that this is happening mm -hmm. with water and that hydrogen should be able to perform similarly falls out from the basic understanding of the electrostatics of the two chemicals. It, it just seems, it seems like a no-brainer in some mm. sense. But uh, I don't know. This is uh, yeah. this is all. Yeah, but what you need is here again a broad, a broad overview. If if you if you talk to specialists, the one one spe specialist says, "Well, I'm my uh, my research is on sunspots. I don't know what a metal is, so to speak." <laughs> I'm right, a little bit right. exaggerating, but that that's the problem in in today's fragmentized science that that people lack that kind of overview. But maybe uh, since I, I realized that we're talking for a while now, but we shouldn't stop before mentioning, I guess, which is the most intuitive, most, uh, the, what I would call the best evidence and, and something that really convinces, uh, is able to convince something without technical background, without equations, without uh, atomic physics even. Look at the videos of these giant uh, solar flares of these eruptions in which material uh, is 
uh, flows out of, of the sun reaches a height of, I don't know, several thousand, several hundred thousand kilometers. And then after a couple of hours, crashes back into the surface and you see the surface lightening up for which there is no reason whatsoever in the standard model. I mean, how could denser gas erupt from a less dense gas in the first place? How could denser gas move through less dense gas and getting fragmentized in all sorts of turbulent ph phenomena? That's what you observe. How could one part of one allegedly denser gas uh, be uh, so so much more or less transparent than the other uh, gas? So moving gas through gas just just makes absolutely no sense. And what you see is here: you see it with your eyes. Uh, you see the condensed matter moving through the uh, through the liquid or through the molecular liquid or the the gas and i think these these eruptions and these videos uh it's just the i mean if you want to use your eyes uh, that's the most direct intuitive evidence that there is a real surface there must be there must be um, different uh, phases, and, and otherwise it's, it just doesn't make sense. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that occurs to me as I look at the landscape in standard astrophysics is that this term plasma mm -hmm. is a very, <laughs> it's almost a free parameter by itself, right? When you really start <laughs> to study plasma physics, you realize mm -hmm. that this phase is really encompassing several phases, in fact, and that it can behave like a liquid and it can behave like a gas. And so in some sense, going back to the uh, William James or whoever uh, paradigm shift idea, there is a way out for the astrophysicists because they can say, well, that's what we meant by plasma. We meant it was a liquid metal, essentially. <laughs> because ultimately, a metal, you can describe a metal as a degenerate electron gas, right? That's, that's true. You can use the yeah. electrodynamic equations and model it as a degenerate electron gas, just yeah. like you can with yeah. the oh, really liquid, right, like ju the color, just yeah. like with a plasma, right? So the word mm -hmm. plasma being so ambiguously defined for the purposes of science is... A nice, easy way out for any astrophysicists who happen to have made it this far into the con conversation. They might be able to keep their term plasma and adjust it to say, okay, well, we meant, yeah. we meant it was a liquid metallic plasma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's certainly true. But it, uh, let's say it's not my job how future generations of astrophysics may downplay this or justify why they have been mistaken for a century. <laughs> just, it's my job to bring that out to the, to the general uh conscious uh, of, of uh, astrophysics and I think it's it's really something uh, people must deal with yeah it's it's really necessary that we we take that model also into into account if you process these data and this, I mean, it's uh, just something I think a lot data. about because we're always confronting people on this show with things <laughs> and I want to do it in a way that's congenial and constructive and does mm -hmm. allow them to save face and I'm always thinking about how I can present a new idea to somebody in a way that's not mm -hmm. going to embarrass them in a yeah. way that's not going to make them think that I'm being arrogant and think I'm smarter than Einstein and everybody yeah, else. Yeah, and I, I just am yeah. always reaching for, for what's the easiest way for this person to consider this. And I think that there's some value in yeah. doing that. I understand it's not the job of the scientist to make it easy yeah. on it, yeah, yeah. but in some sense it, it I it see. I see. No, no, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to say that, but let me, let me, let me add something in the same spirit. I mean, there are, we haven't mentioned magnetic fields and magnetic fields are very interesting and a very uh, huge topic in, in research and, and uh, magnetic fields are invoked often explain all this kind of different phenomena, which, Pierre prefers to explain in another manner, but that doesn't mean that magnetic fields are not present or not interesting or not not relevant for the sun. So there is uh, a lot to uh, to do here, and I just always wonder. I mean, given that the the liquid metallic hydrogen is such a, a perfect producer of magnetic fields, I mean, 
how do magnetic fields occur? Because you have huge currents and for huge currents, you need a metal, okay? So they should welcome uh, this idea to explain these uh, obviously present very strong magnetic fields in the sun. I think, uh, yeah, this is, an, this is an important aspect and maybe hopefully we, we can convince conventional researchers uh, also to embrace the idea. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I was going to say that's probably the steel man of when you were mentioning the magnetic, uh, or sorry, when you were mentioning the solar outbursts and these waves of clearly liquid material falling back to the sun, they're generally explained by cohesion mm. through magnetohydrodynamics, which is, mm -hmm. uh, of course, mm -hmm. the bedrock mm -hmm. of so much solar physics at this point. But yeah, like you say, it's not incompatible with the liquid model. And that's what's just so fascinating to me is that I really believe that this concept of plasma encompasses what Pierre has discovered already to some extent. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of looking mm -hmm. at it from a slightly different angle. And the smallest mm -hmm. angle that you can put yeah. forth in front of people, I think, is how you move paradigms forward in science. It's like, just a little, like you said, you're not going to attack all of these issues. You're not going to fight a war against three massive superpowers. You're going to deal with the smallest battle that you can face at any given time. And so, I think it is really important to, to recognize that magnetics obviously play a huge role in solid state physics as well. And there's, there's mm -hmm. no loss there by reconsidering it in this fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's next okay. for you? <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know. It's not that I want to, don't want to talk about, but I, I, uh, yeah, I have several plans. I mean, one thing is to concentrate on math and continue with the stuff of my uh, the mathematical reality um, considerations about space time, but it's very hard. So I admit the hardest topic at the moment is for me um, artificial intelligence mm. and its development, and I think it will change the entirety of science. There will be a great deal of how method methodology of science will change. It speeds up incredibly uh, conventional scientific work, at least part of it. And let's hope for the better. I mean, there are, of course, negative aspects, fears, dystopias of any kind you can imagine. But I also see a great potential in, in um, working with scientific data. Hmm. Yeah, that would be a cool topic for us to, to get to down the line because we've been talking to a lot of people who are... The re consciousness research seems to really overlap with artificial intelligence research. And so we've been coming at it from the direction of how close are we to actual artificial general intelligence. And there's lots of people who think that the way that the systems are being constructed right now is insufficiently reflective of the material basis of consciousness. And so that we won't be able to get there the way that we're designing them right now, but that doesn't mean that the systems that are being designed right now aren't sufficiently complex to be disruptive and to change the landscape. And so as you start to formalize your thoughts on that, it would be a really interesting conversation, I think. And there hasn't been any physicists in the room for these conversations yet so far, which is s sort of troubling because <laughs> it's very hard to bring physical arguments before a met very metaphysically bound crowd, right? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I look forward to that. That will mm. make a good conversation down the line. Well, I have done my early my early PhD research. I've done in neuroscience and and stuff, but it's I mean, it's a difficult story. Let's let's leave that for another okay. conversation. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving us all this time today, and it's always a pleasure to meet up with you. And I again, I really appreciate that you wrote this book, okay. so I don't have to. And, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's wonderful. It's short, it's yeah. sweet. Everybody should pick it up. We'll put a link down below so that so that folks can check it out. And yeah, man, I look forward to what comes yeah. next from your pen. I, I thank you. I think it's, 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 a, it's a great format, if you, if you allow me to say that, because sometimes with one single interviewer, you're just hopping uh, randomly in a certain direction. And, but... Anastasia is sometimes like keeping the, the the train on the on the right track, and <laughs> at the same time we are walking with with two f with two feet at this time. I think that's that's a great feature of your 
of your podcast. Okay. I appreciate that. So, thank you. Thank you again. And yeah, till next time. All right. Have a great rest of your day.